It doesn't matter what you you don't need to be best than other people around around you. You don't need to do the, to be the best in things, but you have to do your best. Sometimes your best is 20% of your 100, and that's the best you can do that day. But do your 20%. Sometimes it's your 100%, and like that you will never feel any regrets in a way in everything with relationships looking into the past in, at work. This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Solutions, the leading iGaming PAM platform with a modular approach, including many benefits like a fast, secure, and scalable API-based platform integrated with all major third-party products and services. Make sure you head over to Pragmatic Solutions and join our smart thinking. This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Play. A leading game developer providing player favorites to the most successful brands across the industry. With an award-winning multi-product portfolio of slots, live casino, bingo, virtual sports, and more, Pragmatic Play is powering up new possibilities of play through one single API. Visit PragmaticPlay.com and discover your favorite every time. Are you ready? One, two, two three. <laughs> Episode number 200. And I just poisoned my water. Yeah, I, was, there. I just look at my water. God there. damn it. So like, uh, <laughs> episode 200. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Congratulations, are. Pierre Lind. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. It's been a long time for sure. How are you doing today? Uh, uh, I'm very good. <laughs> very good. Coming from very work. Good. Well, this is a... Very special episode uh, today, of course, uh, episode number 200 uh, of the podcast. And uh, I've had uh, the privilege of talking to so many different people with diverse backgrounds and different upbringings and different stories. And I think uh, that's what we are celebrating in the uh, industry in general. But today is a very special edition of the podcast. Carolina, you have been part of my journey for most of the lifetime of this podcast, of course, as uh, my girlfriend. And uh, during this time, I've had the privilege to speak to some of the most incredible people that make up our industry. And one thing that I have observed throughout this time is the incredible variety of people from different backgrounds and cultures. We are a young, innovative, dynamic industry, and we don't care that much for legacy. Some might even call us a misfit, misfit industry. And I would certainly agree with that because it is the misfits that think different and rule the world. As such, we, the agami industry, accept people from all backgrounds and circumstances as long as they share that passion for innovation and hard work. To that end, today I would like to welcome Carolina Estrada Duque to the podcast, my girlfriend. <laughs> Why? Because Carolina shouldn't have been here today. Her story is one of the most inspiring turnaround stories that I have ever come across. Carolina was born in Colombia in a world of chaos as such. She was quite literally escaped death on several occasions. She was raised under basic conditions, sometimes without basic necessities like electricity, constantly moving from village to village with an incredibly challenging childhood, moving from home at 12 years old cleaning toilets, do whatever she needed to do to get by. There is absolutely no reason why you should be here today. However, through adversity, you always chose to be a good person, despite not having much goodness around you. Eventually, you turned your life around, and here you are today, account manager at the global tech company Evolution. It is a pleasure to welcome you to episode number 200, Carolina. How does it feel to be here in the podcast studio? Wow, <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> I prepared oh, for once. Thank you. Yeah, you prepared. Very good. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I feel a bit nervous because I've never been interviewing in my life and not about my personal life, but at the same time, it's very exciting. And uh, and it's also exciting to be, to be like, the guest of your podcast like my boyfriend when i'm being like hearing you all the time in the background at at home in the studio here so 
I am very happy to be here and like, yeah, a bit nervous <laughs> to share my story, but <laughs> it will be good. It will be good. <laughs> It is. It's a. It is so nice to have you here, of course. And uh, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, the most rewarding thing for me during these 200 episodes is to have had the opportunity to give a platform for people that have had very challenging and different uh, backgrounds. Because although some of the episodes where we go a little bit deeper, it's not necessarily always about iGaming specifically, but it highlights the diversity within the industry. And it really shows that we all have a background, right? Like this is not about uh, uh, kind of um, talking about anything like unique or special in the sense, but it's uh, we all carry a story yeah. with us, right? And that is a little bit the point that you want to yeah. bring out today, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think about life in general. Like the more, so in this industry, it's incredible because I, I am an account manager now, but I mean involved since like, I don't know, five years with iGaming people around, like in the events, networking, Sigma, uh, like meeting people. And when people come and open up to you and start telling you stories, you start realizing that everyone has a very difficult and tough background. Like everyone has somehow very challenging childhoods. Like and everyone somehow make it through it, you know? So that is super inspiring and like motivating you to like, just look forward and not backwards somehow. Like, so it, it is very nice. I, I love this industry. It's, <laughs> it's very nice. The people are amazing. So let's go into, uh, into your story, uh, Carolina. You obviously were born from a mother who gave birth to you at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. You were born into uh, a world in Colombia where you didn't have much. Do you want to start from the beginning? So let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I come from a, so from the beginning, beginning, I come from a very uh, broken family, I will say. So that's like the beginning, beginning. Like I come from a broken family and then my mom got pregnant when she was 15. She had me and because of she was 15, I don't judge her. She just left straight away. She just ran away. So basically I grew up going a little bit, not much details, um, with a grandmother, no mother, no father, with uh, mental health issues, my grandmother. And my mom eventually came uh, to bring, like she got pregnant again with my sister, Nicole, then with my sister, Ariana, uh, but she never stayed. It's just like, brought the baby for fun, even if it sounds funny, it was like, it was what it is. And basically uh, my whole life, or at least since I have memory, I'm being the adult and responsible uh, when I was a child, when I was growing up. And when you mentioned that I have been like escaping and like doing this kind of stuff. So basically having not like and it's stable or like a normal setup of family. We have to, it was another people involved in with us, let's say. And because of that, we have to change house all the time. We have to move all the time. And it was a bit of a dark background, the reason why. So we have to not move from house in the same town. We have to jump from, as you say, from, for example, like a villa to a small city, very remote from each other, and then be there for six months or five months or the longest eight months, jump to another place and to another place. Most of the time we didn't have like the basics, like food or things for school or yeah, like not, I don't know, like in a very poor conditions, I would say. So because of this, I'm being working since I'm very young. And as I say, I was the adult, but I was very happy to be the adult. I was responsible of my sisters. I was responsible for school. I was looking after my grandma and my sisters. Um, and yeah, basically. Yeah. And uh, can you talk about that? Because uh, I remember the story you told me about uh, the feeling of being hungry and not having enough food for the whole family. So I remember you telling me that story. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it just kind of wraps up a little bit of uh, kind of one of the moments that you went through and how you view 
this situation because again like today is not uh, it's not about uh, you know feeling uh, sorry for situations or yeah. whatever but uh, what i really respect about you see is the fact that you went through a lot of these difficult moments while still staying positive and uh, still holding your head high and uh, can you talk about the the uh, story you told me about yeah. uh, not having enough food yeah 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 so basically i don't i'm seeing it now but when i was a child i was never i did notice that we had a very different family and we were very different than everyone else around us and every time we move we will have a lot of questions from kids and from friends and why like yeah many why are you not a mom there is no mom there is no father there is no enough things or whatever but for me it was just my reality and uh that particular story i remember i was i can't send the name like uh, it's called el bajo tablazo it's in caldas in colombia we basically have like Tres mil pesos, which it will be nothing, let's say three euros. So we compared to buy food for that week and it was just rice and like something else. And I remember, and then I'm cooking since I'm very young because my grandma was a little bit cuckoo, whatever. So I was, I was the adult uh, in all sense. And I just remember serving like that to my sisters in the little table. And I know there was not, but I just didn't feel hungry anymore why i don't know i see that now you know but the, when i was there in that moment i didn't think about it i was just like yeah i mean like that's that's what it is and and yeah, so you, you, and think I didn't you were serving the family the food yeah, yeah. and there wasn't enough food for yeah, yeah. for you basically yeah. it wasn't enough but I, and at the same time I didn't, like when i noticed it i was like i just didn't have i was not hungry anymore <laughs> you know like why i now i realize when i'm in that situation i was like is so normal and it's like it is what and i also felt that i was in charge so i was taking the decisions at home i was taking like any small decision like what my sister is going to wear where when we were have to move where are we going to move and how old are we since uh, six since six five. Years old. Yeah. <laughs> five years old so you were the adult since you I were was, yeah, yeah when i was five, five that was my first job i was selling empanadas <laughs> yes <laughs> And, and selling them literally in the streets. Um, but I never, and I never felt immature or as a child. I, I actually never play as well, for example. I hate the idea of look, of being dirty and sweat and like doing kids things. So for me, it was my sisters will go and play and do whatever, and I will be home fixing the house, cleaning, organizing things for the next day. Very important school, da da da. And then I will be just be an adult. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> and uh, how do you think, uh, like psychologically, uh, you know, that impacts a person when they have to be the adult and the person who drives the family since uh, five years of age? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy. Now I don't feel like that anymore. I I start like letting go and like I'm being exploring my child side now. Like I I let myself to be silly and like maybe to be a bit more like let go of things and stuff and since i start with you even more uh, <laughs> so so it's very nice but it is pretty heavy because no one wants to have so many so much responsibilities on top i was responsible for emotional and like physically and everything at home you know yeah so yeah. you were the stability yeah. uh, in yeah. the family and you were the, you were the oldest uh, sister the as well oldest, right yeah. of the family the and oldest and the first uh, granddaughter as well and the first granddaughter, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, can you talk more about kind of the positive mindset that you uh, that you continuously had through this uh, journey? Like, because even this, uh, where you say that uh, you gave out food to the family members and you just didn't feel hungry, that's also kind of part of a positive mindset. Let's say that uh, you know you didn't go into the negativity that could come from that. Perhaps is that something you thought about consciously? How to kind of keep that uh, mindset while you were struggling I, to be honest like through the whole journey and stuff i was not the most positive person but i was not negative either i just because i was with a very mature that can be very immature but it was like a very adult way of seeing life and i was comparing myself to adults around me i just figured out what i didn't want to be and what i didn't want to do so i never thought oh i want to be this oh i want when i was growing up i just 
I was just very clear what I didn't want. And, and, I, di- and I didn't want to be like my any of my family. I didn't want to be like my grandma. I didn't want to uh, be involved in this um, dark side that I was around. Uh, and I did want to have stability. I did want to be for at least one year in a school, you know, to have friends, like be quite normal. So all I knew is that I wanted to grow up as fast as I can, so I can just decide by myself and I don't need to be like under other people's decisions. Yeah. Do you have an idea of where that decision came from, that you didn't want to go down that dark path? Because that would be the easy path, right? That's where you saw everyone around you going down that yeah. path. I don't, I, to be honest, I still have that question in my mind because it's very difficult because everyone, and for example, I know my sisters and everyone around, they actually see that as life, you know, and it's an easy life as well and get things easy and like, I don't know what click on my mind and I can't tell you exactly when, um, but I just knew that I didn't want to be on that pattern of cows, like, I, I was, I mean, my family was like, like very disorganized, like mentally, uh, in all settings also, like there was so many psychological abuse, day and night, all the time, my house was never quiet. So I think all these cows constantly, 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 in my mind, I just reject that. I didn't yeah. want that. And I wanted to be a structure and calm and like I just didn't want to be in the same uh, setting yeah yeah you cannot build up uh, barriers yeah. against it uh, to protect yeah. yourself as yeah, and I still was like overprotecting my family in a way because I felt that that was my responsibility and also I felt that because I can see things from above I had even more responsibility on helping them to change so I was always like when I was a little bit more like I don't know uh, 14 15 I start like telling people what, like, what 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 you need to change like to my family in general, and I was like again like very chaotic and mix and like yeah like very mm. chaotic uh, yeah and w- environment. One, one story uh, I remember t- uh, you telling me is uh, one time uh, you were part of a shooting mm-hmm. uh, incident, right where. Literally, it was uh, escaping yeah. potentially so, really bad consequences. Can you talk about that story? Yeah, so that one, that was when I was maybe six, seven, I don't remember, but I was quite, yeah, like a child. So basically, there was, we were on a farmhouse with some other people, with more family, and we were quite, so something to know about my growing up it was that we were like in our minds we had some family close to us that they didn't live with us but they were all the time telling us like oh by the way tomorrow we're gonna be rich now it's over we don't need to suffer anymore but then that never happened and sometimes we will go to places and or to house for a month or two months but we did have a lot so it was like it was like we never knew what, what, what's like yeah we have now we will have everything but that will last two months and then t- the rest it will be really bad so it was like very up and very down so at that time it was one of those situations where we were going to be up and happy because there was money and like a uh, family were together like there was people my mom until now no but there was people around that was close to us like extra people kids we had a pool the best for kids you know and we were there maybe like the second night, like we were there for very few, I don't remember exactly, but some people against the people that we were with and against my family, uh, I have to say, like in Colombia, we have this cartel that I know people are familiar with. So it was like a cartel situation in that moment. And they came and started shooting everyone. And then we have to run, I remember, someone grabbing us and putting us in a car and like literally like this and then we have to go and I was looking in the window like it was literally like uh, very chaotic and you just hear and we just run like literally running and unfortunately on that day a lot of people die including a girl of like six 
six five i don't remember he was the daughter with one of the people that we were with uh that was very tragic so i think that's why i have it a lot in my mind i was involved in a couple of situations like that while i was growing up uh but i was i never felt fear like i n- i was never scared yeah. i was just that's what is happening what we have to do like what's what's the plan on my head it was so, okay what's the plan i i never like freaked out or like yeah, so like when the shooting started how what was your reaction <laughs> the first thing i thought is like okay kill me <laughs> like okay i'm going front like that's the first thing i i oh wow why do you think I, you reacted like that because of the responsibility i had in my shoulders i think thinking right now in the podcast while we record the podcast because it was so natural for me. It's not that I want to be the superhero or I want to be nothing that crossed my mind and not until now. It was just my first reaction. And in a couple of times when that will happen and like when we receive a call that we have to leave and then I have to, then my grandma, she was very unstable emotionally and I had to calm her down every time. I always stop by myself like, okay, I, I don't mind. Like I just go... I confront the people or whatever. If I have to confront them, I will do it. Mm. I didn't have any other thoughts about it. I'm like, that's what it is and that's it. Like, that's nothing around or overthinking nothing. I was just, okay. And then when I'm front, in front of that person or people or situation, whatever, I will see what to do and I will figure it out. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. Yeah. F- <laughs> fearless. Yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. Mm. And, and, has, I, and I'm pretty nothing. much like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, uh, but you were saying it has nothing to do with courage necessarily. It no. is just that you were fearless. Yeah, I just, yeah, that was my life. And I was just, my role in my life, it was being the one that is protecting. And like, it was the one that hmm. it has to be in front. Like that was, that's why I was here basically when I was growing up. So yeah. I took that for real without even thinking about it. And that's who who I was. What mm-hmm. do you think? Uh, so just uh, moving forward a little bit before we go back in, like what uh, w- w- your childhood? How what what were the traits that you have today uh, that came from your childhood? Would you say, like uh, what what uh, are you still retaining in your personality? I mean, I have I have a lot. I think we we will never get rid of of that because it's like it's it's how we grow up and we develop our brain until we're seven so whatever we mm. we develop until we're seven then it's like what it is i got a lot of positive ones and then some that are not so positive that i work on on it and i'm trying to be aware so it doesn't go against me and trying to change it around so it's actually helping me but for example, in a very positive way, thanks to me jumping around all the time, trying to having to change schools all the time, being the new one all the time, trying to tell a story all the time, it makes me a very social person. I have zero problem on connecting with people. I love going and jumping. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Carolina, by the way. Like, what do you do for life? Like, who are you? Tell me about your life. Like that, it was something it comes is so natural for me and it's like it's like an automatic thing that i have every time i'm in a room if there is new people i just boop, run to them <laughs> and to go and like make friends with them uh so that's something from my childhood also because i was also always the new i know how it feels being rejected when you are the new person people that people don't like and it's cool less like you don't want like it's just the weird So that, it gave me, I don't want to sound like, oh, too much, but uh, I have a lot of empathy for people who is a bit reject. Okay. And I always, and I can notice that quite easy and I go and I just make them feel comfortable because I was there. Yeah. And that's something that I love to have. Like, I'm so grateful for that. Yeah, and actually, uh, actually uh, just to fit a point in that, uh, this happened uh, actually last week where you and me were out for a dinner with a group of uh, uh, people. Yes. And one person in this group was uh, having a little bit hard time to connect with yeah. everyone else. You noticed that and moved over to uh, to this guy to And we had an amazing conversation about his job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was uh, several people afterwards that like, uh, came up and uh, noticed that and 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't do it thinking about it. It no. comes very natural. But then, you since towards a, people who are re- rejected yes. a But then, since I'm in the right circle of people, those people are being so nice, telling me about those things because before I didn't notice those things. And the people, like all your friends and my friends that I have now, they make me realize about all these good things that that I have thanks to my like. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting as well, like you say, that, uh, of course, having to move school so frequently as a child is very traumatic. I remember I moved school when I was 15. I moved <laughs> from my mother to my father. And I can still remember vividly waking up the first day that I was supposed to go to this new school in a new town. And I was speaking a different accent. <laughs> and uh, I remember vividly jumping on the bike, thinking that I'm biking towards my death. You know, <laughs> it's like the most traumatic thing that I could ever think of is like to enter a new uh, school at the age of 15 where with all the hormones and everything else. But uh, for you, this became a frequent thing, right? Yeah, and it because was... of that, uh, it became just uh, as a coping mechanism I suppose you developed this superpower to just yeah, get it, to know people very quickly. It was my quickly. comfort zone now like I remember if we're gonna be in a place like for more than one year I was feeling uncomfortable I'm like okay like now it's time for change like yeah. where are we going next? Uh, it became my comfort zone and but thanks to that I developed and I also because of how chaotic the people around me and how like all the lies that I grew up with because as I told you like they will come and tell you one thing and they will do another thing and they this was a constant in my whole like my whole life until now they still have the same dynamic so I something that I take away from that that is very positive is I'm very analytic with per, with people in a very good way like I can't so that helps me to know exactly how to go you know like and i and thanks to that i get i fall in love with psychology and self-development and understanding human behavior and sociology and like and then i go here and there and i start studying and then i i'm involved in all this war that i love <laughs> <laughs> our dog is in the studio today in the 200th episode here Valpen. he agrees with me <laughs> <laughs> Valpen is our second guest <laughs> 200 um yes. so um, yeah, two guys, two hundred. So yeah, so um, yeah, so then it's like I it it, it was a bit uh, sorry for the word fucked up childhood and I was yeah in a very like uh, very chaotic family, very like broken family. I will say a lot of pain, a lot of uh, mental health issues, a lot of um I don't know how to put this like bad decisions because they wanted the power and money and stuff like that so it was like up and down and like this that all this makes me be in love with what i'm making my life now in a way like loving people doing the best i can't doing it in the right way not taking the easy ways because it just show me all the things that i don't want and i will never want when you look back uh, at the your childhood and the circumstances that you grew up in do you feel resentment uh, towards that? Do you feel anger towards the way that uh, well, um, the circumstances that you were put in? So for a long time, yes. I will lie if I say no. For a long time, and that, and that was my drive until I was 21, 22. That was my drive. And I love to have that anger inside of me and like resentment. And that pushed me. That was my fuel to, to, to work. But not anymore. Like, I just look back and I'm like, because I start understanding, then I see like, oh, actually, I have a narcissist grandmother, vulnerable narcissist, where she, and she has a very tough background as well. Then how was the, my grandfather with her, that that was a very, another fucked up story. How my mom, she is also, she is like a child, and you know, like, then I start understanding under the reasons why they were taking decisions, like why they were acting the way they were acting and they didn't have, you always have options, but sometimes I think when you are so locked into a pattern that repeats, it's very difficult to see, to take another decision. 
So I understand them. I understand why they were acting the way they were acting, why we were in the circumstances that we were, like, and I'm okay with that, you know? Yeah. Something uh, that uh, me and my siblings have talked about a lot uh, is uh, if you take a thousand kids that are grown up in childhoods with uh, parents that are alcoholic or if there's a single parent that is has raised you if there is a lot of fights in the family or if there's mental instability the child is more likely uh, out of a thousand children they are more likely to fall into the same, the same uh, pattern. pattern yeah and um they are much less likely to succeed from that environment. A stable upbringing is uh, more likely correlated to also lead to a, a more stable uh, growing up situation. Mm -hmm. However, whenever you speak to someone who is highly successful, most of the time they come from a fucked up past. Yeah. True. And so it seems to be that in these, uh, this environment that you have grown up in, um, either you go down the same path or the energy becomes so strong towards the other end that uh, you supersede everyone's expectations yeah. and uh, reach higher but why do you think that is it's quite complicated in my family my sisters they're quiet like also in the same pattern like my sister also had a baby when she was 15 as well she has two babies now uh, and they kind of repeat and they wanted to go, they wanted to be involved in the same business that like over and over. I think in my case, it was because I was always aware. So for example, when we were very little, that uh, thing, like things start getting messy around when I was five, or at least since I have like memory, my grandma always saw me as like, um, someone that she can just rely on so i always knew how fucked up things were and what was behind things and she was she talked to me in a very rough way so i was pretty much aware of what was going on so i was never i was i i know clearly what my mom was what my uncle was what my grandma was like I always knew all the darkness. So since day one, I choose, I don't, I need to change that. But for my sisters, and I think that's why a lot of children or so like a lot of uh, people, they grow up and they follow the patterns because they don't realize. And in order to you protect yourself, you try to put like this in the your mask. face, the mask, so you don't see and you just continue because, sorry, because it's much easier. Uh, but for me, I didn't have that option in a way, so I was always like with my eyes pretty open, even more. Like I think I was more catastrophic because I was always like mm. trying, like looking around and like being very protective in a way. So maybe that's why I also had. Um, I was living with a, another family for like a year, and they showed me another way of living as well. They were more structured, very fucked up in another ways, but there was like mom, father that they work, they go to normal school, you get normal new books, <laughs> <laughs> you eat normal, <laughs> you have breakfast, lunch, dinner, sometimes a snack, like, which it sounds like pretty luxury uh, for me on that times. So they kind of show me for that year that uh, life can be different. Uh, that's another also fucked up story with them, but uh, but I think I was lucky that I maybe I went away as well for a while and I kind of s had like the comparison. Yeah, you saw a, a different perspective. A different person, yeah, different perspective, different way of seeing life. Because also for my family, because they are so like they were, s they are very negative towards a lot of things, and they just care about money. Mm. That's all they care. In my house, no one. No one ever expressed love. Hmm. That's something that doesn't exist. Like it's so. I told I told my sister for the first time I love her. Like love you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe four years ago. <laughs> How did that feel? 
it it was very weird. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was like, I need to do this, like. <laughs> But it's just, it's like here, but you cannot take it out because it's not normal. Like at home, we don't hug. We don't. Now a little bit more because also I have another Ariana, my other sister. She's trying to figure out as well. I, I was speaking a lot to her. I'm a little bit rough as well because that's the way I used to be with them. I was very, I, was, I couldn't be sweet when I never knew what was that. So I was also very tough to my sisters. But right now, when all the discovering and stuff, um, we're trying to like change it. And now we try to say sometimes, ah, I love you. But it's very <laughs> awkward <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for for all of us, you know. But this is also part of uh, working through yeah. that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Yeah. So at 12 years old, you decide to move from home. Yeah. And, and start working and living and living into your, moving into your own flat. Yeah, so when I was... 12 what happened is that is my mom appears she wanted to be responsible in a way so i felt like that i like i had my way out in a way that's how i felt but she then appeared to be living with us she just wanted to be taking care of us like with money she started working in contact and stuff so we moved to live to another villa where all the friends that i made they were very they were in university and I was this tall when I was 12, 13. So I, I'd never look so young. And because my personality was so mature, people will never think I was so young. So I just find a family that were renting a room. I had friends that they used to visit a lot, a coffee that I can't remember the name, but I know they will sell in like the most amazing coladas if the Spanish speakers here, like Colombia. And I just asked them to hire me for a like I wanted to work in wherever. So they hired me to work behind. And if the police come or wherever, I will just hide. I will never have uniform. And then I just find a very, a very cheap room close. And then I just start living by myself and working. And it was the best year, I will say, of my life because it, it lasts just one year because then they have to move and I move with them. Hmm. again but then when I yeah and then I started again and then I was alone it's like yeah I was living by myself and then with them and then yeah back and forth, but back it was forth. just one full year it was super nice yeah here working and living by myself can you talk uh, then we fast forward a little bit uh, in how you managed to take yourself to Malta of all places you know you were <laughs> grown up in I like to say that you're grown up in the jungle yeah. uh, <laughs> raised by the bam uh, panther, panther and the bear yeah, uh, <laughs> aka Mowgli Carolina yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, in, in any case how did you how were you able to take yourself from Malta of all places in on earth this little tiny insignificant rock from uh, the yeah. big jung mighty jungle so that is quite a story i'm gonna try to make it fast so when i uh, finished school like school school high, high high school i just say i'm gonna live by myself and i don't care and i found a job my first job was burger king <laughs> i love it i love the team if they see this and they understand english i love them like it was the best year of my life and i started living by myself i was 18 uh, and I have a very happy life that year apart like I moved to a city very far from my family and then I was like okay then in Burger King I was escalating quite because I'm always being super hard work and because I'm very adult in my mindset I always want to do somehow I want to be the best I can't like it's like a challenge with myself I can do this what if I can do this so in Burger King I was growing quite fast and then I, at some point, there was like, I was already uh, like a team leader there. And I was like, I don't see my life working like in Burger King. I need to study now. So then t I went to a bank, different banks, someone to like loan money for me to start study. I found someone, I found university, I start paying and then I changed jobs. So a job that can't let me study and work at the same time. And my life was pretty boring. I would woke up every day at 3, 33 in the morning, <laughs> make sandwiches and uh, juices to sail in the university for breakfast. I will have class at 6 in the morning until 10. 
I will sell that. Then I will run to my job that I start at 11 until 8, and then I will go to university from 9 till 10. That was my life from Monday to Friday, and then on Saturday just in the in my job from <laughs> 11 till 8. So you would sleep like three hours a night. Or yeah, something. and I was just like no stop. That was my life for a year and a half. Then uh, Malta came to the table. That I was I had a boyfriend at the time, and he went, he came here to study English. And then Malta came at the table and my idea it was like, how cool is that, an island? And I remember I, I was working in a fashion show, in a fashion shop, sorry. And one of the clients, she was like, it was a very expensive shop, so just expensive people were going there. Talking to one of the clients and she was living on an island, I don't remember where. And I felt that that was the most cool thing ever can ever dream about it you live in an island like a little in the like in the world like in an island around <laughs> sea like how cool is that i just was like wow so then he came and then malta ended up being an island in the middle of the sea and i was thinking like about oh, how beautiful is that so then i make uh, plans like i save money i took money out from the when you like i resigned to my job so you take like some in colombia you get they gave you some money that they save from you from uh, from the salary and I came to Malta for holidays. It was going to be the holidays of my life. The first time traveling. Traveling. The yeah. first time traveling. Um, and I came here in July. And I completely love it. It was so nice. And it was this was eight years ago? Eight years ago. Yeah. Eight. Yes, eight years ago. And when I came, it was a plan for holidays. I spent my whole money, but I, I'm very extreme as well. Like when I really like something, I want to leave as much as I can't so I didn't care but it was like it was a plan for two months so when then I came I didn't have much money and then I found a job in a lemon because he was a, an Italian owner with a Colombian a girlfriend and they hired me in this lemon in Slima for people who live in Malta <laughs> uh, in front of Sara yes it's a car that looks like a lemon a right? lemon yes yeah. <laughs> and uh, they hired me they were paying me two euro two euro fifty for per hour and for me it was the best thing ever i was in front of the sea people were coming and smiling to speak to me in a language that i didn't understand but i find it super cool um and then i end up having when i had my and then still it was the plan to leave but i was falling in love with malta and then when i got my first payment 500 euro i felt like i was completely rich <laughs> I was like, what I'm doing in my life? What I'm going to ba go back for what? To not leave? I had so much freedom in that month. I was working from 4 p.m. until 10. It was, I had the mornings for myself. I was like in, in front of the be like the sea. I was like uh, in another culture. I was like, I was just so happy to be here. So then I just, after that, and I felt like I had all the money in the world. I say, I'm not going to go back. I don't, and uh, and I found a job as a cleaner. They hired me. Um, I start. I didn't have money to start uh, to study in a school, so I started studying in um in YouTube, and like with Duolingo and like practicing and hearing people how to talk and I like imitating them and. Yeah, so you you didn't speak English when nothing, you came no. here at all, right? No, I just hi, hello. <laughs> Is it correct? I don't know. It was like it was really bad. I was very shy. Because he was so new for me, so overwhelming, I felt like very tiny. But then, and then I was a cleaner for like two years because I didn't, I couldn't like, I had dyslexia as well, so it's a bit harder for me to to learn. Um, but then when I get it, then I'm like okay, a little bit, then I'm like, okay, now it's time to step up, waitress. I'm gonna be a waitress, and then I start being a waitress. Then I was uh, I was working in everything. I was at the same time. I had my full time job, but I always had a part time job. I was working in events. I was hosting. I was um, I was working as a bartender. Then I was working as a live presenter for iGaming. That was like I was working. That was like super rough two years because I was like. From seven in the seven thirty until three thirty four, I was working at Cafe Cuba as a bartender, and from ten p.m. until seven a.m., I was working as a live presenter. Oh wow! And that was my, but I never, I didn't feel I was just working, you know, like, 
And I was so happy and like I'm making things and things happening for me. I was so proactive all the time, moving, moving, moving. Mm. And on top of that, events like if was there a boxing, I'm going to be there. If there is like a networking event for a gaming, I was the girl in the door. Like, hi, what's your name? Which company? Da, da, da. So that's how my first steps into the eye gaming. I work in Sigma and then uh, COVID happened and it was the best think ever for me i'm sorry for people that lost a lot of people i know it's it's a very like difficult topic but for me it was the best like like it was the first time i stopped in my whole life i had no job i had nothing to do just be at home so when that happened at the beginning i freaked out a bit but then i started just looking into my inside myself i got in a very beautiful journey of figuring it out like what I really want to do. Then I thought for the first time, where do I really want to go? Is this helping me to be the person I want to be? Who I want to be? Why am I, why I act like that? Why things are like that around? So I start doing a uh, therapy on that and those times. I start going into meditation. I start reading a lot. I was like, figure around. I did my first for people that believe or not, like manifestation letter where I wrote down what I want, how I want it. And believe it or not, all that happened. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but everything happened. Uh, I was so, I was feeling so connected with me, with everything, being trying to be more understanding. And like, I didn't feel ang anger on myself for the first time in very long time, even though I was already like letting go of a few things, but that was the first time. And then on that manifestation letter, I wanted to be someone doing a business. I wanted to be someone that understands about like negotiations and like sales. I like sales a lot, like things that moves me and like put me in the, mm. in the spot in a way. Because you had been to Sigma as a hostess, right? Yeah. And then you see people in suits making deals. So and... that was my first year. So that was before COVID that I went to the first Sigma. And that was my first thought. So I went with Gaming One. I was there to show, uh, they hired me to show, like to be in charge of like the coffee for the people for the meetings and to be, to show the game. And I remember seeing the people in the meetings. I was like, so cool the way they were talking, the way they were dressing, the industry, like so interesting. And I'm like, I want that. I really want that. There was opportunities to be, um in customer support and like uh game presenter and like escalate yourself so that was how a lot of people they were doing but i really something inside of me i just i really want to go to that like i don't want to even though other things are very cool as well and you learn a lot but i really i really wanted to be that and it came to me <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk about uh, malta you know, coming here as uh, a third country national, the opportunity that Malta presented to you, creating a life here, but it doesn't, didn't come for free, right? Like, can you talk about uh, how do you feel about Malta today? I love Malta. <laughs> I think I'm the most in, like, I always say Malta is the best country in the world. I love here. I feel more home Malta and more my place than Colombia. And I think Malta is such a, it's a country that really does, I'm just talking from my own experience, really does open up opportunities for people that from other countries. I know it's quite difficult, but is much easier than in other places. And in Malta, in Colombia, I don't think this will ever happen to me. I will be very like, I don't know. I mean, I can't think about things, but it's like Malta is such a, like also because of the iGaming industry here, like it's so easy for you if you work hard and if, if you have your mind in the right place, you can make it here because it's so small and that make, that helps for that. So I love being here and it's not being easy, no, but you can do it if you do right, you know, if you don't, if you, if you have good intentions for yeah. the country and you, and you have, have you, and you know, in your mind that you are in another country. So you respect that 
It's like I'm in another house that is fake, that makes me feel like mine, but still is not my house. Yeah, because a lot of people uh, complain about Malta, right? A lot, and, and, a uh, lot. <laughs> and, uh, I always uh, find it funny, you know, because you are the first one to defend Malta whenever yeah. someone, uh, because Malta gave you a life. More a or life, less. and a part of that, like, Malta is such a unique and for me magic place like imagine you have a very stressful job in a big city how will make you feel to go out here you have a stressful job and you are like overwhelmed of things and stuff but it's quite easy to get to to your house then after it's quite easy to go to get food delivery it's very easy to get a taxi it's very easy for you to go and connect with nature even if you don't believe it we're around water like Mm. we are are around life the whole time we are in a rock yeah but it's all around water with animals we have like when we go to hike there's a lot of beautiful nature you know like it just has everything because it's like it has a very heavy industry like very like tech companies like very business oriented blah, 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 blah. but at the same time you feel in holidays in a way mm. and that for me make a little bit to have like the balance in life yeah i, I love malta I think it's amazing. <laughs> and, and about the uh, industry itself, I think as well, because we are a young industry, the mm-hmm. uh, agami industry has only been here for around 24, 25 years. Uh, it means that there isn't that much legacy in the industry. There is, it's very hard to study yourself into a career in agami. Most of the professionals have started from the bottom and they didn't necessarily intend to make an indus- make a career in an the industry. They, mm-hmm. Most people kind of stumbled into the industry somehow. Uh, but what it means, I think, is that those people that work hard, they are the ones that make it. Yes, hundred percent. Right? Yeah. I do believe in in uh, hard work. Like yesterday, I was listening to your the podcast that you record with Carolina Pelk, and I agree with her. You need to work hard. Like you, if you want to make it, if you want, there is. I mean, uh, it can be a balance, but. You need to work hard because life has a lot of things and a lot of people are hungry. So you need to work hard for it. And that's how I yeah. I believe it and I live it as well, like working hard. Yes. It's smart as well, but you need to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, Kedana, you also are going full circle in a way because something that you never talk about and you're very humble in, in how you help other people. But uh, mm-hmm. most Saturdays you go to uh, the kids down in, in uh, the south of Malta where there's the refugee center mm-hmm. and uh, you go and take care of the kids uh, there on, the, on Saturdays. Uh, the kids that come here from, uh, you know, from the boats over to the Mediterranean Sea, over here from other parts of the world as refugees. Can you talk more about what it means to you to be around those kids that perhaps uh, come with a similar background to yourself? Yeah. That you say it yourself. That's how it feels for me. It's, it makes me. I mean, it makes me feel so happy and grateful, and connected to them, because I know how it feels to don't belong to any like anywhere. You don't belong to anywhere. You sometimes like you don't have family and you don't have like he must oppor- much opportunities and like yeah like looks dark around you but for me to be able to go and bring some happiness to them and like to play with them and to talk to the oldest uh, kids like eight nine years old i think about how i was feeling live when i was that age and i give advices to them that i would like to have when i was that, that child and that is fulfill my heart and I know, and I love them so much. I miss them because I couldn't be there in the last month. Um, but yeah, it means a lot to me. I love them and I want to, if it was for, and I, and I, now I'm a child. With them, I don't care. I like to be dirty. We, we paint and then we start playing that we need to put our hands in us and like run and be whatever with water balloons. Like yeah. it's, it just gave me so much life and they are so cute. and. Yeah. Very vulnerable. One thing I noticed when I pick you up from there on Saturdays is uh, how happy the kids uh, seem. Yes, they are very cute. You know, they live under very basic conditions uh, over there. Obviously, in, in the summer here, it's very hot and uh, mm-hmm. 
it can be difficult over there for them with the circumstances they're in, but they are always really happy and running very around happy. just like normal kids. So. Yeah, they are very, very happy kids and very smart kids. I'm like, wow, they teach me English every time I go. You don't pronounce it like that. <laughs> like, tell me how do I pronounce it? <laughs> uh, it's extreme. Like, it's, it's, they are very, I mean, of course, it's kids. So I think all kids are happy in a way because you go into your own bubble. But to be able to talk to someone with other perspectives and with a little bit more understanding of on psychology is nice to have mm -hmm. when you were when you're a child and that's what i'm trying to do so i try to go and find the right tone and the right words depend on what is happening there as well yeah. what would you say is the important things to think about if you've had a difficult childhood like many of us uh, have mm -hmm. what are All the us, I will say. yeah what are the most what are the important things to focus on in order to stay positive okay positive i don't know if it would be the right word to say but in order to be more calm or more with more acceptance so you can move forward i will say is that we need to it sounds cliche but we need to put ourselves in the person that you think they did something to you or the circumstances at least that's what it helped me understanding them it makes me be more accept, like I accept them because I could understand why they were acting the way they're acting. So not question why they did that to me because, so there is a book that is called The Four Agreements and uh, it's from Don Miguel Ruiz, he's a Mexican shaman. If you didn't read it, you should, I will highly recommend it. And The Four Agreements is, First, I will. I don't remember the order, but first is don't take anything personal. Second is don't make assumptions. Third is be impeccable with your word. And four is um, okay. I forgot. I will, when I remember, I tell you. But to don't take things personal is the one that clicks more in my head. And in the book, they say even if someone come and shoot you, literally, you shouldn't take it that personal because. It's nothing to be with you why that person is taking that decision. They have something on their head and their thoughts are speaking to them, not you. So that will, I will say, like, don't just put it outside from you. No one did anything to us in a way. I know it's hurtful and it's like, yeah, a lot of horrible things people did to us, but try to put it on that. So knowing that is on them and they were the people that they were sick on their heads, they were the people that had trouble, they were not healthy because if someone comes to hurt you, they are not healthy. You know, they have issues. So just to put it on the side and accept that that's who they are and you don't have to be the same or correlated, even if it's your family yeah. to them. And then you feel like, you feel like the luggage drops mm. and then you can just, and you are a completely owner of your life. That's another book. <laughs> <laughs> El actor, the actor from the same author that he explains so well how we are the protagonist, the antagonist, the, 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 the um, director, the um, everything on our lives. We decide what to be, how to do it, it's difficult because we have patterns, but we can we have the power to decide who we want to be and what we want to do with our life. We just need to be clear and like, like draw, like draw at least the, the way you want to take. So it doesn't take you by surprise and you take any. Yeah. I yeah. will say that at yeah. least it helped me. Yeah. I think, so, so to the four agreements here, we are lucky to have our uh, ChatGPT friend uh, oh, yeah, here, yeah. by the way. And uh, speaking of uh, ChatGPT, my dear girlfriend here, whenever we have an argument, <laughs> uses uh, ChatGPT Chat as the decision maker and Chat the judge GPT and the execution agent. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever we have an argument, Carolina will go on ChatGPT. She will type the argument to ChatGPT <laughs> and then we'll... Okay, uh, not that she will, literally, she but... She will yeah. ask ChatGPT who was right and wrong in this <laughs> argument. And, and that's was, how we decide. And how, uh, how often you write? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Zero. Not, that, not that often, to be honest. Whereas, stereotypically, my girlfriend is always oh, right, of yeah. course. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, the four agreements uh, here with uh, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, as you said, is uh, be impeccable with your word, be impeccable with speak your word. with integrity. Uh, oh, I remember agreement. the fourth. Okay, which which one is it? It's um, wait, always do your best. Yes, there you go. There and you that's go. ten points to Yeah, yeah, and that's what the one I actually always tell you, and we we speak about, and I always church in my in my. Um, a colleague with my colleagues it doesn't matter what you you don't need to be best than other people around around you you don't need to do the, to be the best in things but you have to do your best sometimes your best is 20 percent of your hundred and that's the best you can do that day but do your 20 percent sometimes it's your hundred percent and like that you will never feel any regrets in a way in everything with relationships, looking into the past, in, at work, in any task that you have or like yeah. things that you want to accomplish. And maybe that can be translated to, you know, when you were a cleaner cleaning toilets, you know, instead of uh, self-pity and uh, why am I doing this degrading work, yeah, no. be the best cleaner you can be. And I, and I love it. I, I always I always say like, I always wanted to have, like if I was cleaning, I wanted to have the most clean place. Like I was cleaning houses, offices. Uh, there was a, some place like I had to clean toilets for a while, where it was very not nice. Uh, but that was I. I never felt bad or sad or like I was just wanted to. Even if it was very dirty, it was quite satisfying to just clean everything out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was like I was just doing the best I can with everything. Yeah, and I think. Um, as an employer, you know, in our company, we are now 40 people and uh, we employ on a regular basis. And something that I've learned that I have a, that I think a lot about for myself now as well is, you know, when you try to find the best possible employee within your company, it is really not about the experience. That is not the most important factor in most uh, situations, in most roles, let's say. But if you go into a McDonald's, pay very careful attention to the person who works the hardest mm -hmm. in the McDonald's restaurant because they don't necessarily have any reason to work more than they are contracted to do. Yeah. It's not going to benefit them in any meaningful big way other than they have the integrity uh, wanting to do the best they can. Uh, the, those are the people. Yeah. Those are the people that you look for. right? The people yeah, that true. have no reason true. to do more than they have to yeah, other the than their own integrity yeah yes that that's is true. the key that's true yeah yeah that's what we should look for so the other the other four agreements uh, so you said always do your best um be impeccable with your word is the first agreement you know speak with integrity stand up with your shoulders straight the second agreement as you mentioned too is uh, don't take anything personally right understand that other people's actions and words are reflections of their own reality not yours and when you take things personally you become vulnerable to needless suffering and i think this is what we talked about a little bit yeah. when you think about your past yes right everyone has a reason for their flaws yeah there is always something behind it and i yeah. always remember an interesting story that i read once that uh, there was a father mm. that entered a train with uh, his two kids uh, they sat down and uh, immediately the kids started running all over the train and starting to be loud. People in that train became more and more annoyed. And uh, they were all giving looks at the father, like, why are you not, why are you not telling your kids? Like, why are you not telling your kids to behave? And eventually one of the passengers went to the father and, and like, hey, listen, you need to take care of your kids. Mm -hmm. They are annoying us. And the, ki and the father broke down in tears, saying that they just came from the hospital. Their mother just passed away. And I don't know what to do. Yeah. The point being is that there is always oh. a story. Yeah, always. There's always a story. There is always a story and the other part. Yes. Um, agreement number three, don't make assumptions. Avoid assuming what others are thinking That's or the most difficult one. why things happen. Misunderstandings are often born from assumptions. So communicate clearly and ask questions. Why is it the most difficult one? At least for me, it's the most difficult one because I'm not um, because I think to myself that I can kind of 
understand how people behave. So I usually take for like, I just think straight away that I know answers why people are behaving the way they are behaving. So I usually take assumptions about that. that. Now, like lately, I've been trying to ask more questions to be more clear about like what exactly is happening here. Why this happening? Even like at work, I'm trying to do it a lot. You know, like if is there any changes? Okay, I go to my manager very casually, instead of me thinking, oh, this is happening because of this or because of that, or like making assumptions and assumptions from my own story. I just go. I just for I just went to him, for example, like that this just happened last week, and I just like, hey, I just want to have a like open conversation and I want to know why this change, why, why we're doing this in the company, why did da, 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 da. And then everything went away and it was very simple. It was not what I was thinking about. It. <laughs> um, so for me, it's the most difficult one because you don't want to ask questions. You don't want to sound silly. You don't want to sound that you don't know. No one wants to be the person that doesn't know. So it's much easier to just make assumptions. So right. that thing, that's why it's the most difficult one, to be vulnerable enough to go and ask. Yeah. And the irony is that from an employer's point of view, if you are a good manager, you recognize that the, the more stupid questions that you get, the more, the more it means that your em new employee wants to do well. Mm -hmm. Because no one is a superhero. No one has the answers uh, when they start a new position, even if they have the experience. Yeah. Uh, but it takes guts to ask uh, silly yeah. questions. And the only reason you would do it is because you have integrity and you really can't stand the other op op option, yeah. which is to not do well enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. Mm. It's true. <laughs> so a uh, question to you as well, uh, Carolina. So now you are account manager at uh, the global tech company Evolution, 20 yes. billion euro company. How do you use your background and your upbringing uh, to excel in your current position as account manager? To be honest, it feels like uh, my childhood was preparing me for my career <laughs> in a way because it helped me in all ways. Like, first of all, I have like in the industry as account manager role is a lot of relationships uh, related. And because of my childhood, I learned to love people you know, and I, it's just come to me very natural. Uh, so this helped me to be with them. I have a very a different approach than other people because I see things from, thanks to my, my childhood, I have like a much bigger perspective in a way. So that makes me to have a little bit of a overview over my clients, for example, or my environment at work. Uh, I'm very organized, so I was very organized. The I'm OCD. very organized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The OCD cleaning. <laughs> yeah, we just move. Trait. We just move desk, and then we have like it's me, then it's another girl, and another girl, and then this desk is slightly moved there, and I was, my eyes like, oh please, Anna, just move the desk so we can be all alive. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's like, so I'm like very organized. I'm very, um, I like to do my best always in everything. So in my relationships, uh, at work, in my own personal different tasks that I do for myself. And I think you, to be an account manager, you have to be like that. You have to do your best always. It's a lot of different things going on and like very, um, very different things that you have to look at. So it's like, it's perfect. And also because of my childhood, I'm very comfortable on the change. For me, being subtle in a way is a bit like uncomfortable, I will say. So in this job, it's perfect for me because I'm just all over and yeah. I'm comfortable with that and I know how to handle it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, like I love people. I have to work with people. I love talking to people. Um, I'm very organized. I love like uh, helping people. So for me, the best is to do business cases for my clients. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is in my own, like we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it like this, like this, like this in order to get here. So I create goals and like, so it is, it's, I enjoy a lot my job. It's very nice. <laughs> I love, that's my favorite part, you know, like 
organizing. When I had to do my first presentation in the QBR, I came to you like, look at this, and I'm going to yeah. tell them. And I managed to grow them this from this to this, and I get super excited. And so, yeah. How does it uh, make you feel now to think about and reflect of the fact that uh, you came from the background you came, you had the experiences you had, and now you reach that milestone of being the businesswoman that you that always dreamt be. of uh, <laughs> being? It is pretty amazing, I will say. And from here, going up, my goal is, uh, is going up, but um, I'm super grateful. And I told you this, I think it has happened two months ago when it clicked me very randomly in Georgia. I was in the hotel, in a five-star hotel, alone in the sauna with the old view of the city in front of me. It was like, I don't know, 30 floor, super high. And I just felt extremely grateful and I couldn't believe that I was all where what one day I wanted to be or like I was seeing people that I wanted to be. Because I, I had like, um, so one of my inspirations now that I remember, the wife of my uncle, she's a lawyer, very, very good lawyer. And she was like the business woman. She was a bit f far from me, from my family and everything. But sometimes I will see her and I will love the way she was. Like when we had to go to her office, like two times in my whole life, I went to her office. It was just the best environment, the best setup. And I was like, all this is dark kicking. And like, for me, it's just like, I can't believe it. You know, sometimes it's like, wow. Like, it's actually true that when you work hard, it pays somehow. Um, and I cried for the first time for happiness. I was like, and I called you, remember? <laughs> it was super nice. I feel very grateful. I love it. And for me, every day is a, like, like a gift in a way, even if it sounds cliche and cheesy, it's like, I love it. For me, every day is a huge opportunity that is coming to me that I don't want to let it go or take it for granted. Yeah. Because you know how it, uh, yeah. how it is to not have anything. You know how it is to yeah. not every be time, to Every time I go to a now Michelin restaurant, like I told you, like to see that when I, it was so many years that I didn't have the option of which food I wanted to eat and like, or what, where do I want to do or what I want to do. So for me to have all this luxury in a way, like, or even not Michelin style, just a normal restaurant or like just at home to choose that I, what I want to eat. It's incredible. And I'm very much aware about it. Like it's in my head constantly. And I'm very grateful for that. Almost every day, I journal almost every day. And that's things, that's the first things I write always. You're I'm very careful, yeah. Mm. And every day and every day that I go into the office is a opportunity that comes to me and that I need to do my best with that. <laughs> what are your ambitions for the future? Oh, wow. There's a lot of ambitions. Work-wise, I do want to, I want to continue on a, a commercial. I find absolutely enjoyable. And I love, uh, it's a lot to learn. Uh, I like the industry. I think it's very fun. I think it's very, it's in a way perfect. You say something yesterday in the podcast and that I, it clicks a lot on me. And it's that this industry is not predictable. And I love that, you know, and I navigate very easy, unpredictable things. Uh, and that makes me want to be. and even more involved in this. But I do want to reach uh, a higher level in the industry. I don't know yet exactly where do I want to be because I like strategy a lot. I love marketing a lot, uh, commercial as well. So right now I'm being eight months uh, working for Evolution as an account manager and I love it. So there is so many opportunities for me to go, like to take. Um, so I don't know exactly, maybe next podcast we'll see in <laughs> one year or two years. And then personally, I mean, I have a lot of side projects. I have a mini podcast. Uh, I finish a book. 
I just finished my master in psychology, marketing and business growth. Um, yeah, we are in an amazing state in our relationship. We have Balpan. It's a lot of <laughs> exciting things. <laughs> right now, life is very good. <laughs> <laughs> right now, things are in order. Yeah, things are very good. Yes. <laughs> things are in order. Let's uh, let's wrap this up. I uh, see if we can bring uh, Valpan uh, here as well to introduce yeah. him to him. Oh my God, Come here, Valpan. come here, Valpan. Come here. Uh, you can see is, them. Yes. Valpan. This is our nine-year-old Labrador who has been with us for. For no. Valpen, he keeps us sane when things are difficult. Valpen is there as a stability. Very cute. See. Yes. Uh, there's many lessons we can get from uh, from Valpen, I think. Yes. <laughs> well, um, Carolina, uh, I know this was uh, not uh, easy uh, for you to to speak about this. I know we were planning this for for some time, and I uh, really do appreciate the fact that you are able to open up uh, to this extent and what I've learned from the previous episodes where we've had guests who have been willing to open up is that there comes so much positivity from uh, this type of um, episodes because we can all uh, relate to some extent to uh, to, to yeah. a difficult We're all connected uh, back, in yeah, all many different yeah. ways in stories yeah. and childhoods and that's what is more like the more you talk to people about their their childhood <laughs> uh, the more you realize that we are all in the same you know we are all, it can be many different stories but how we felt about that what happened it connect us in a way so that's beautiful you know that is beautiful. beautiful and yeah. you're beautiful <laughs> and uh, I love you so much I love you thank you so much for coming on board the thank you thank you <laughs> Episode 200. Yay. Yay. We did it. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs>